I'm going to re be reading uh, Ephesians 5, 25 through 32 in the NIV version. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her a holy cleansing, to make her holy and cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And after all, no one has ever hated their own bodies, but they feed and care for their bodies just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his husband, excuse me, leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Thank you, Donald, for reading the scripture, and thank you so much for clarifying uh, what you were reading there. Good evening. It's, it's good to see you tonight. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we're, we're continuing in this study of the Church of the Bible, and I think it's timely. In fact, I think it's overdue. Uh, for those that are here that are maybe visiting with us or if you're watching online at a later time, uh, if you ask people today, why do you worship at the church that you worship at, you'll get a variety of answers. Some people will say, well, this, my family has always worshipped here. Some people will say, well, we, we like the people. Some people will say they have a fantastic youth program. Other people will say, I, we worship where we worship uh, because they have incredible potlucks. Um, you're not going to hear, or you very rarely will hear, we worship where we worship because we believe that it's the church of the Bible. The only people you might hear say that are members of the church of Christ. And when we say that, you know what happens next. Oh. You think you're the only ones, right? I got news for you. We're, we're not. We're not. Um, when we put the, the name Church of Christ on the sign out front, in effect, to a degree, we denominated ourselves just like anybody else. Because there are multiple names, multiple references to the Church of the Bible within the Bible. And one of those that we're going to look at tonight is that of being the Bride of Christ, now, when I started this series, I asked a question, how many of you have been traveling down the highway and come up behind a semi that says, attend the church of your choice this week? We've all seen that. I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming we've all seen that. I've seen it hundreds of times. My question in response to that is, are we to attend the church of our choice or are we to attend and participate and serve in the church of God's choice? Does God have a choice. When you look at the scriptures, there's only one church that the scriptures talk about. And it's the church of the Bible. And it's referred to in a number of different ways. And again, we're going to take a look at the church as the bride of Christ this evening. We've looked at what the church is not. I think we started by saying, okay, before we can really understand what the church is, let's cover what it's not. It's not a building. This building been here a long time. We have a lot of sentimental attachment to this building. Some of you have been here your whole life. There's a lot of great memories and a lot of sentimental attachment to this structure, to this property, but it's bricks and mortar. The church is the people that come in the doors and go out into the world. We are the church. The church is not a building, but the church is also not a denomination. I've made the point a number of times. I'll make it again. There are over 200 Christian denominations in the United States alone. Jesus went to the garden in the Gospel of John, and he prayed before going to the cross, Father, may they be one as we are one. Not 200 plus and growing. And so there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect on, on theological issues, on doctrinal issues, on what the Bible says and what the Bible means with regard to who the church is and what the church does. And as we continue in who the church is, the church is the bride of Christ, at some point we're going to transition to what the church of the Bible does. 
And so before we get into the message tonight, let's, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Lord and our God, thank you for bringing us back together this evening and, and bringing us back to look at the different aspects of your church and what you called us to be. You've called us to be so many things. You've called us to be your people. You've called us to be your body. You've called us to be called out of this world, ecclesia, to be called to a special purpose, to be holy, to be at work in your vineyard. Lord, you've called us to be the bride of Christ. And the passage that was read this evening that Paul shared to the Ephesians is a beautiful passage. But it's a passage that many times is misunderstood. It's not so much about the relationship of husbands and wives as it is about Christ and the church. Father, help us to understand tonight what it means to be the bride of Christ as individuals and as the church. Spirit, I just ask that this message will be your message, that you will speak in a powerful way to us to help us have a deeper understanding of of who we are and what you've called us to be. Jesus, we thank you so much for bearing the cross for us and bearing our sins upon your shoulders and going through that separation for us from your Father for a time. Lord, we just pray that we'll take what we hear tonight and apply it to our lives and and be the bride of Christ that you've called us to be. Lord, we, we love you so much and we thank you so much. We praise you in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study, as I've said already, is, is broken down into three main sections. What the Church of the Bible isn't, what the Church of the Bible is, and what the Church of the Bible does. And so far, we've, we've seen that it isn't a building, it isn't a denomination, but the Church of the Bible is just that. It's the Church of the Bible. And there's no hyphenated Christians in the Bible. You know, I'll meet people on the street, and I, you know, we'll talk. Well, eventually, we get to to the church, and you know, I'll I'll ask, well, where do you worship? Well, I'm a Baptist. Well, that's not what I asked. Where do you worship? Well, I, I worship in such and such Baptist church. Or I'll ask somebody, you know, the same question, and I'll get, you know, another answer. Uh, I'm a Methodist. Well, are you a Christian? Well, yeah, I'm a Methodist Christian. I can't find book, chapter, and verse for that. It's not there. And so there are no hyphenated Christians in the Scriptures. That's what a lot of people don't understand. And even if they do understand it, they're not interested in investigating it deeper to find out why. I think it's very important that we understand why. And so, family, we need to understand that even though that John, in our English translation, is referred to as John the Baptist, that is an inaccuracy. John was the baptizer. Not the Baptist. And so you can see over the course of time, there's a lot of translational things that have caused us to be where we are. And so it's important that we go back to discover who we truly are. Something else we need to understand, there's also no Church of Christ Christians in the New Testament. Now, you do read in Romans 16, 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. We need to understand what that means. That is not a justification scripture for the name on the building. That's not what that is. Now, people have used that before. I've actually heard people use it that way before. But it doesn't mean that, that there was a building in every village in the New Testament that said, Church of Christ meets here. It wasn't there. Family, there were no denominations in the time of the early church. The church was one. It was one body. And family, the church of the Bible is referred to, as I said, in a number of different ways. In the scriptures, it's referred to as the called out. It's referred to as the body of Christ. It's referred to as the household of God. It is referred to as the vineyard of the Lord, which we've talked about as well, and in many other ways. But in our time, we're going to take a look together as the church of the Bible being referred to as the Bride of Christ. So in our scripture reading that that Donald shared with us just a moment ago, 
we see that Paul uses the analogy of biblical marriage between a husband and a wife to describe the relationship between Christ and the church. Paul puts it into terms that we can understand. He puts it in terms that we should clearly be able to relate to and to understand. And he makes it relational family rather than ceremonial. He makes it relational rather than procedural. you got to remember, the church of the, of the New Testament, the, the, the church of the Bible, is made up of two very distinct groups, Jews and Gentiles. And to the Jewish Christians in his audience, they would see a very stark difference between what Paul describes here in the Ephesian letter and the procedural and ceremonial experiences of the temple, while still maintaining singular devotion to the Lord. The Gentile Christians, the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, would see the orderliness and the spiritual monogamy of the church and our relationship with Christ as opposed to the wild frenzy that was known to them as pagan worship with their, their, their very interesting sacrifices and their temple prostitutes and the other things that they participated in and called worship. So the love and the devotion and the pure commitment of the relationship between the husband and the wife is the example that Paul lays out there. And it's a good example. It's the right example. This is the example that he lays out there of what the relationship of the church or the Bible is to be to Christ. What your relationship and my relationship is to be to Jesus. And so when does that happen? A lot of people are not clear about the answer to that question. When does that happen? When do we enter into that relationship with Christ? At what point are we betrothed to Jesus, waiting for his return to claim us, both individually and collectively, as the church, as his bride? Now, Paul lays this out very beautifully in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Listen to what he says in verses 1 to 3. He says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, That the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. So that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Now take a good look at what Paul says there to the church in Rome. The word that is used in the original language for joined to another man is the word genomai, and it means married. It means to be married. Now look at what he goes on to say in verses 4 to 6. He says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we've been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness, of the letter. Look at what Paul is saying there. He says, We were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. And this echoes what he says to the Colossians in chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, where he writes, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us. All our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of death, which is the law, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Family, the joining of Jesus and with Jesus as the bride of Christ for you and I came in our baptism. 
It came at that time when we surrendered our life to Jesus, we confessed Him as Lord, we repented of our sins, and we entered into baptism where our sins were washed away. That family is when we became a part of the bride of Christ, when we were baptized into Christ because of what He did at the cross. That's when that happened. Now we understand that. But the majority of the Christian world doesn't see it that way. They don't go to that extent. They talk about preaching the gospel, but they really don't know what the gospel is. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And you and I are commanded to obey that. And we do that, we obey the gospel of Christ when we're baptized into Christ. There's a disconnect out there in the world when it comes to that. Again, look what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. He says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined, married, to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. Look at what he says right there. Why have you and I been joined to Jesus? Why are you and I, the bride of Christ, connected to Christ? For what purpose? Look at what he says. He says that we might bear fruit for God. That's important for you and I to remember in our identity as Christians. Family, that's the point where the lost sinner dies to the world. Look at what he's saying there. And is raised up and joined together with Jesus as the bride of Christ in the church of the Bible. So as the bride of Christ... As the church of the Bible, we've been called to that role. There's a lot of things that we could cover tonight, but there's a few that I want to focus on. First, as the bride of Christ, the church of the Bible has been called to be submissive. Family, the word submissive is a hard one for people to deal with. That's a hard word for people to deal with in the culture in which we live. And here's the thing. The reality is that nobody really wants to be submissive, do they? Nobody wants to volunteer for that. Nobody wants to be submissive. It's, it's, a, it's a term, it's a word that we really struggle with in our culture. But this is exactly what Paul tells the church in our scripture reading this evening to do. Look at verse 24. He says, but as the church is subject to Christ or submissive to Christ, so also the wives ought to be submissive to their husbands and everything. Now again, remember what Paul is doing here. He's not primarily talking about husbands and wives. He's talking about the church in Christ. And so look at what he says there. Look at what he says. As the church is subject to Christ. This is where Paul begins. This is where he starts. This is the example. This is the model. This is the aspiration of your relationship and my relationship with Jesus. And even though the subject, again, is, is Christian marriage and the relationship between husbands and wives, that's not what the big picture is about here in this passage. The example that Paul uses is the relationship between Christ and the church, between Jesus and his bride. Between Jesus and you and me. Family, the word that's translated into our English Bible there as subject, or your translation may read submissive to Christ, is the word hupotasso in the Greek. And it's a compound word that's made up of two parts. The first part, hupo, means to be under, to be underneath. Or to be below. The second part is tasso, and it is a prolonged version of the primary verb. It's like a it's like an amplifier of the first part. It's a prolonged version of the primary verb, and it means to arrange in an orderly manner, to assign to a certain position or lot, or to ordain or to set. Now, when you put that together and you get subject or submissive in our English translation, when you put it all together, what does that mean? 
Well, family, what it means is that the church, as the bride of Christ, you and I, have been assigned an orderly position by God that is under the assigned leadership of Christ. That's what that means. Now, why would we, as believers, willingly subject ourselves or submit ourselves to that? What could possibly motivate us to bend our free will toward enthusiastically living under an arrangement such as that? Notice what Paul says in verses 25 to 27 of our text. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Family, take a good look at that. And what Paul writes. Let me ask this question. What bride, whether it be the church or a wife, wouldn't willingly and enthusiastically submit or subject herself to the assigned leadership of a husband who loves her like that? Fellas, the reason why there's so many marital problems in the world today is because too many men don't understand what it means to be a Christian husband. And the reason why is because too many men, too many Christian men, as a part of the bride of Christ, are not willing to be submissive and are not willing to be subjective to Christ as their husband. Family, not only has the church of the Bible as the bride of Christ has been called to be submissive, she has also been called to be faithful. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus instructs John in the vision to write to the church in Smyrna regarding the trials and the tribulations that he says is coming. He asked John to write to them and to inform them of what is coming their way in the future. Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write this, The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Now, I don't want to spend a bunch of time getting bogged down in the symbolism of the angel of the church to Smyrna, or what the ten days means, whether that's literal ten days or symbolic ten days, that's for another occasion, okay? But there are a few things I do want to look at in this passage with regard to faithfulness that is asked of the bride of Christ that I want to take a look at tonight. First, the resurrected... And the living Jesus in this passage shows them and shows you and I this evening that he knows what we're going through. Not only does he know what we're going through, family, he knows what's coming around the corner. He knows what we're going through and what we're dealing with. And in this case, it was the blasphemy of those who were saying that they were Jews, but they really weren't. There was division in that church. Some folks in that congregation had a superiority complex and it was hurting everybody. He also clearly points out the fact that the source of their tribulation was Satan. Family, let me tell you something, that has never changed. It has never changed and it never will change. 
doesn't matter what the politics is that's going on. doesn't matter what the racial situation is that's going on. It doesn't matter what all the confusion is. Satan is always the enemy. These people claiming to be Jews in this passage and putting everyone through so much misery were tools. They were tools in Satan's hand, family, just like people are that give us grief today. And family, the real enemy of the church is Satan. He always has been. He always will be. Second, Jesus tells us, do not fear. Do not fear. You know, that's important for you and me not to forget. Because there's a lot of scary things that go on in our life. When you're sitting in the doctor's office and you're waiting for the test to come back, Jesus says, do not fear. That's a little easier said than done, isn't it? When your child is late coming home and you don't know where they are and they're not answering their phone, Jesus says, do not fear. Well, that ain't always easy, is it? But Jesus always proves to be trustworthy. Jesus says, do not fear. We need to never forget that. Look at what he says in verse 10. He says, do not fear for what you are about to suffer. Jesus tells them that suffering is coming. It's not maybe. It's not possibly. He says it's coming. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Family, he's told us the same thing. He's told us the same thing. We have challenges that are in front of us. We don't know what they are. But regardless of what they are, Jesus says to you and he says to me, do not fear what you are about to suffer. In the second part of verse 10, Jesus says that the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. Man, how would you feel when that letter was read at your congregation in Smyrna? Some of y'all are going to prison so that Satan can test you. My question would be, who? You got a list there? It's not important. Because what did Jesus say before that? He said, do not fear what is coming your way. Some of y'all are going to prison. That word tested there in that passage is the word parazo. And at its root, it means to pierce. Now, with that understanding, look at what Jesus says. Some of you are going to be pierced. I don't know about you, but I've been pierced before. I've stepped on nails. I've shot myself in the hand with a nail gun. Some of y'all have done that too. There is no easy way to suffer a piercing. Of course, unless you're, you know, female and you get the ice cube on your ear and, you know, do all that. But I'm talking about real piercing. Jesus is saying it's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. Jesus tells us that as believers, as the church of the Bible, as the bride of Christ, we will experience painful trials. If 2021 had been easy for you, I'd like to know why and how. It's been hard. And there's no guarantee that it's going to get easier. We have our own painful trials ahead of us. And as the bride of Christ, we're going to experience painful trials. We're going to experience testing. We're going to experience scrutiny that will pierce us to our soul. That's what Jesus is saying here. And Jesus tells them, this is coming. And if we're truly his followers, family, then we can expect the same warning. In fact, we should take the same warning. But we also can expect... And we also can depend on the same encouragement from him. Do not fear. Do not fear because of what he says in the third part of verse 10. Look at what he says. He says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Notice what Jesus says there. Notice what he says there by first noticing what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, be perfect until death. Aren't you glad? He doesn't say, be perfect until death. No, he says, be faithful. Be faithful, be true, 
Be honest, be trustworthy, be convincing, be reliable until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? Why should that be important to you and to me this evening? It's important because of what Jesus says last in verse 11. Listen to what he says. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Now take a good look at that and understand some facts. Understand something very, very important. Every person in this room watching online at a later time, every person that has ever lived, every person on this earth, every one of us is destined to die once. We're all going to physically die. We're not getting out of that one. We are destined to die once, but not all of us will die twice. Now, a lot of people in the world don't understand that. They're like, what? They don't get it. They don't understand what I mean by that. The second death is hell. The second death is hell, which is that eternal separation from the Lord. And those who are submissive to the Lord and those who are faithful to the Lord will not suffer that second death of hell. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was, was buried in Hades. He was, he was not where we want to be. He was experiencing the, the front end of the second death. What about Lazarus? The Bible says that the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom and that there was a great chasm that separated the two of them, which you couldn't cross over from one to the other. They could see each other, they recognized each other, and they could speak to one another. You want to know what's going to happen after we die? Go back and read that sometime. That'll give you a pretty good idea of what we can look forward to. And I'm looking forward to one side of it rather than the other side of it. But here's the deal. Some of us are only going to die once. A whole lot of other people are going to die twice. Family, if we're submissive to the Lord and if we're faithful to the Lord, we will not suffer the second death. This is the promise that Jesus makes to the bride of Christ. Ultimately, the church of the Bible, the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ is to be fruitful. And that's important that we understand because I think that's something that a lot of Christian people have forgotten. The church, the bride of Christ, is to be fruitful. You see, the church was purchased by Christ. It was purchased by the blood of Christ to grow. And we see this clearly in the New Testament. We've also seen it very clearly throughout history. But as I pointed out a few weeks ago, and you may remember this, the church has become stagnant. And it ceased to grow. Back in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, the church was planting churches by the hundreds. By the hundreds in those decades. That's not happening now. In fact, right now, six congregations of the churches of Christ close their doors every year. And those are pre-COVID numbers. And again, I'll ask you, take a look around. What did this room look like 20 years ago? I realize COVID is going on, but go back and think about pre-COVID. What did this auditorium look like in 1985? 1990? 95. It's changed, hadn't it? But the mandate, if you will, for us to grow, the kingdom has never changed. That mandate is still in effect. You and I have been called to be fruitful and to grow the church. And the church has failed in that mission. The church has failed to be fruitful. And I believe that ties directly to the other two points that I've already made in our time together this evening. The church has not been submissive to the Lord in relationship. And the church has not been faithful to the Lord in the commission to grow. As I said a moment ago, the result of this is being seen in congregations that are closing all over. And they're closing for different reasons. They're closing primarily because they haven't been fruitful and haven't grown. Some are closing because they made ill-advised decisions. 
Let me tell you something. We are blessed here at the Mesquite Church Christ to have zero debt. Because there's a lot of churches out there that cannot float their debt and they're going under. We can chalk that up to wise leadership. We are blessed here at the Mesquite Church of Christ. But primarily, these churches that are closing is because they haven't been submissive and haven't been faithful. Let me ask you a question. This is going to be a hard one. How many people do you know How many members of the church continue to roam the countryside in the midst of this COVID pandemic? They haven't missed a single dance recital. They haven't missed a single soccer or basketball game. They haven't missed a barbecue joint this side of the Mississippi. They haven't missed a sale at Home Depot or Walmart. But they haven't darkened the door of this building and assembled with the body of Christ since the pandemic began. Do you know anybody like that? I do. We all do. Some people who ought to know better are taking the Lord for a fool. I take no pleasure in saying that, but it's true. We can't take the Lord for a fool. And let me tell you something, Christ is no fool. Listen to what he says in John chapter 15, verse 2. He says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Take a good look at what Jesus says there. We're all familiar with that passage, but have we really thought about what he's saying? Look at what he says there. Every branch, every Christian that does not bear fruit, sooner or later, one way or another, the Father takes away. That's a fact. And the word that's used there and is translated in in our English Bible as he takes away means to lighten, it means to lift off, it means to weigh anchor, and it means to sail away. That's what that word means. Now notice that the unfruitful believer, even though he or she may initiate that, they may, you know, take an extended vacation or whatever or or continue to participate online when they could be here assembled with the body of Christ. We may initiate that and initiate that in fruitfulness, but ultimately the decision to be taken away is not a decision that they make. The Father makes that decision. And He does it because He has no other choice. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Notice what Jesus says last in verse 2. He says, In every branch that bears fruit, every branch that's doing what they were called to do, every branch that's doing what they were created to do as a part of the body of Christ, every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it. He prunes it. So that it may bear more fruit. Now the word i got a problem with, with is that word prune. That sounds a little rough to me. He prunes it. I know what happens when I prune a tree. I'm cutting something off. That's a word that we might struggle with a little bit. The word that stands out is that word prune. What does it mean? What does it mean in the original language? What are we supposed to get out of that word that we're not getting out of it in our English? It means to purge. It means to cleanse. And so who prunes us? Who cleans us? Who makes us more fruitful family? The Lord does. When we allow him to do so. You see, we have to allow it. We have to volunteer for that. We have to step up to that. And let me ask you a question. Is that what you need right now? Do you need to be pruned? Do you need to be cleansed? I'll say it again. Lord the world upside down with 12 people the Lord can do a lot of things with the people in this room if we allow him to do it do you need to be cleansed and pruned this evening only you and the Lord know that the bride of Christ which is the church of the Bible is submissive is faithful and is fruitful because of and as a reaction to the sacrificial love of Jesus And so let me 
encourage the 40 or maybe 50 so branches in this room tonight. Allow yourself to be pruned. Allow yourself to be cleansed. I include myself in that because we all need it. Because what we're dealing with right now, I believe, is what none of us wanted to deal with. That we ever thought we would have to deal with in the world that we're living in today. We're living in a world that is this close. We heard it our whole life. We're one generation away from what? Apostasy. None of us ever thought it would happen in our lifetime. None of us ever thought it would be possible in our lifetime on our watch. But it is possible. And if we do nothing, it's probable. So I just ask that you would examine your own life and your own commitment to the Lord. And just ask yourself, do I need to be pruned? Do I need prayer to be a better Christian? Do I need to repent of some things and share some things that I'm struggling with with my family? Because I'm telling you right now, you will never find a more loving group of people to bear your burdens and bear your soul with than the people in this room right now. And if that's what you need to do, let us wrap our arms around you. Let us pray with you and pray over you. If you need to rededicate your life to Christ, now's a good time to do that. Some people have asked me, can you be rebaptized? My answer is no. You really, there's no real such thing as rebaptism. You're baptized once for real. There's a lot of people that get wet multiple times. But let me ask you this. If you're not sure that you're going to heaven, if something happened to you right now, you might want to think about it. Because Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we can hope that we go to heaven. He went to the cross so that we can know that we're going to heaven. And it's not arrogance to feel that way. It's blessed assurance because I trust Jesus. I trust what Jesus did. And so therefore, I believe what John wrote in 1 John 5, 13. Remember what he said? I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have everlasting life. I know I have it. I know I'm going to heaven because of what Jesus did for me. And you can know because of what he's done for you. So that's the message tonight. Be the bride of Christ. Be the light of the world. Be the salt of the earth this week. And if you have a need of any kind, respond while we stand and sing.